fantastic upset against Fnatic just a few days ago. And a lot of it was unlocked by Hyun and we did. We heard Maxwell talking about the players being maybe somewhat underrated. I know we were talking a lot about them a few days ago, and we'll see whether or not they'll be unlocked again. Right, picks and bans. Uh, Rakan, Kalista off the table, NIP towards Rockat. Zach and Ash in reply. I think Galio and Elise and Thresh are the big ones that I still see as open, and there goes Thresh. Yeah, notice how many power picks Ninjas in Pajamas are actually banning away themselves. Uh, trying to take away that ability for Rockat to pick up two power picks. Zyre is still available uh, along. I feel like that's one of the big picks that Hyana has had some success with so far with his fairly wide range of AD carries that he has been bringing out. Looking at some of the power picks, Lee Sin is a big one, especially for a player like Shook, but with Galio still on the board, wouldn't be surprised if we saw that being an early rotate for the side of Ninjas. Yeah, you'd have to feel that priority goes up. Nagne has played that twice in the mid lane and unfortunately lost both games. Let's see if NIP can turn that one around. Galio locked in, it's going to be the Varus Lee Sin combination for Rocket. So not only do they deny the Lee Sin from Shook, arguably one of his best performing jungle champions, but also it allows Pride Stalker to be on a playmaking jungler that can just, uh, follow up or set up with this virus in order to make a lot of fights happen. Conventionally, you will see a lot of the answers being that Kha'Zix and now Ninjas in Pajamas. I feel like they want to try and get themselves an AD carry on the board with Caitlyn still available. You want to try and lock her in relatively early uh, so that you don't limit that AD carry. Point. And as predicted, Vidius, it is locked in. So, Caitlyn there for Hikyu. Technically, that Galio can flex. Wow. And uh, surprise blind pick Fiora, unless they're anticipating this Galio top. Well, the thing is, conventionally, from Ninjas in Pajamas, every time they've picked Galio, they have sent it mid. So it's more of an expectation that it would be a Nagne Galio rather than a Prophet Galio, especially when you consider the playstyles. I think this is exciting because Prophet is the kind of player that likes to play carry champion. He's played a lot of Jarvan, he's brought out the Jace and the Rumble as well. And I think that when you go for a Fiora, you're challenging Prophet to that 1v1 duel. And of course, if you look at the stats on the bottom of your screen, Fiora undefeated in the summer split. 6 and 0. Every time she's played Wonder, is responsible for 3 of those victories. Let's see whether or not Foxy breaks the streak or continues it. We're into ban phase number two. Kennen and Jace removed by Rockat. Cassio and X, one ban still left available. Cassio, something that we have seen actually run into the Galio, so that just yesterday. Um, and Rockat are going to set themselves up. Blitzcrank <laughs> taken away from Wadid. Definitely one of the playmakers. You can actually see Wadid smiling and hopping around in his chair there. Yep. Blitzcrank has been rising heavily in priority. So instead, we're going. I don't know if it's safe to call it old school at this point, but Zyra has been a staple support in the meta for a very long time. A common answer from uh, teams, especially over in the LCK, has been Tom Kench. In the laning phase, it really does suck, but once you get past that point, you have that flanking engage power. And what I feel like Ninjas in Pajamas are lacking right now is some alternative form of damage. So if that is a Galio mid lane, I want to see Prophet come out on something that he can really make a splash on. Like a rumble. Like a rumble. That'll he do. He can make a splash. He can equalize a red carpet, if you will, yeah, of good. damage, yes. Vedius. And I like this combination. I think NIP have got pretty good team fighting, pretty good scaling, pretty good front. It feels like their comp can do, well, really everything relatively well. The only thing they lack is a reliable, hard engage. While as a team, yes, it is great at fighting, Caitlyn needs a few items to ramp up. Rumble hits a fairly decent one item spike, but that's not really going to be enough to be able to win out against this Rockat lineup who are going to try and set up the 1-3-1. One, one. When you look at this game, the big thing that you need to bear in mind is, number one, you have to keep Faxi down. You have to try and put a lot of pressure on him because once that Fiora gets two items, there is no answer on the side of the ninjas in pajamas. And the same goes for the mid lane. If you allow this Vladimir to just free farm, he's going to get to a point where, again, ninjas won't have any answers. They built this composition to fight you. They want the 5v5. So falling behind early could result in disaster. That's potentially problematic for this Rockat squad. We talked extensively about Pride Stalker's early game lack of impact on his Elise, which is his most played champion. Uh, Lee Sin, another early game jungler. It's his first time in 2017 playing that champion. And while Pride Stalker made up for some early game weaknesses a few days ago, the Smite Stalker plays at the end of the series against Fnatic allowed them to win. Rocket have got some scaling on their side, and 
my eyes are going to be on Pride Stalker. His impact and how well he can try to control Shook, who actually has the favorable matchup. Yep. We heard from Max Law earlier in the day before the show that usually Kha'Zix has a lot more early trading power when it goes up against Lee Sin. He can win out a lot of those 2v2s, so the pressure's going to be on both junglers to try and get their teams ahead in the early game. And will it be Pride Stalker or will it be Shook? The King Slayer's Rockat take to the stage to take down Ninjas in Pajamas. Will this be a 2-0 week for them or not? Remember, well, I said it a whole lot a few days ago. Rockat started spring on a seven-game losing streak, and they ended spring on a six-game winning streak. So at this time, comparison to last split, Rockat already have more yeah. series <laughs> wins, Vedius. Yep. Meanwhile, Ninjas in Pajamas have not won a game yet. They've come very close many a times against some of the top teams in Europe. And uh, expectations were that this was going to be two teams fighting at zero wins, trying to get themselves onto the board at last. But now that after Rocket's surprising victory over Fnatic, pressure's on NIP right now, because if they are yet to get themselves a series win, it's just going to strengthen the gap between them and the rest of the teams in Group A. You know, I'm really glad you mentioned that surprising win. Cool, Vedius. Because I have been thinking about this matchup and wondering who who the favorite should be. Yeah. Because you know of our four series that have happened this week, three of them have resulted in a shock result. Okay. All right. Three of them, the underdog was victorious, which means 75% of our games this week, the unexpected team won. And in this series, because Rock App beat Fnatic, they're the team that's expected to win. So in summary, there's a 75% chance that NIP takes down Rocket today. Ah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Fascinating mm -hmm. statistic there, Quickshot. Now, I've been doing some digging of my own, and uh, I found out that one in two casters love to make up stats that sound like bollocks. So <laughs> I feel like we both have trends that we can track in this series. So what that, what, what that means, by the end of this series, we'll figure out which one of us is the lion. We will. Whether you made that up, or I made mine up. I guess we will. And we will go on results-based analysis, <laughs> Young Day. Our favorite here in the European LCS. Shall we continue talking about that the game? Is, what would you like to talk about, Quickshot? I'd like to talk about Shook's impact in the early game. Because I just happen to have another stat, which is slightly more relevant and important. Five out of six games this split, Shook has helped secure first blood for his team. Now, you can look at that in two different ways, right? Because you can look at it in the sense of, oh, Shook is really good at being able to set up early game plays, get NIP ahead. Like, he's the big facilitator for making stuff happen for his team. Or you can look at it in the sense of the rest of his team have no idea what to do unless Shook is around. And whether or not you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, you can debate for a while. But the reality is Shook is the guy that all the action happens around in the early game. That is a good thing in this matchup because Pride Stalker is not the guy where the early game action happens around for the Rocket squad. So NIP may have an additional opportunity this game. Wadid took a lot of damage there, stepping on that snap trap, eating what looks like a fried egg, not a cupcake on the skin. And that means he loses a bunch of his HP. This Zyra Varus starting to shove the lane in. And something else I'm noticing, double TPs on both sides. So these mid to late game, Fights and lane pushes are going to get very, very juicy. And I think I think it's really important to, to talk about that, right? Because these mid to late game fights, who will they go in favor of? Because when you think about the two, three item spike, you'd want to give it over to NIP, largely because you have a Rumble, you have a Kha'Zix, you have a Caitlyn. All of them scale exceptionally well, and they are so good at these 4v4, 5v5 scenarios, especially when you have the support of a Galio and the peeling of a Tom Kench. But in the 1v1, in a, in a 2v2, in the skirmish sense of things, Rockat are the team who would be able to win out if they're on those three, two, three item points. So you can see that both these teams are aiming for very different things. The risk you have is how you get to that point. Because if NIP are able to force all these fights, they're the ones setting up vision control around the Baron. They're the ones setting up for the Dragon plays. Then it's always Rockat that have to respond. So Rockat, it's very important for them to get an early lead so that they can make things happen and start for, start splitting NIP up and drawing pressure all across the map. What I like about the different styles, though, is teams need to be proactive in making their style work. Or they need to punish their opponents while they're attempting to set that up. So 
few different uh, ways to get an advantage, and the observers highlighted the vision superiority that NIP had. That's why Shook is standing in a bush. He's about to taste Pride Stalker's fear. Isolation bonus may be available as well. Look at the minimap. Mid laners are making their way up. Shook, a lot of damage onto Pride Stalker and forces him to ward hop to safety. Bear in mind the patience that Shook demonstrated there. He has to be careful, Lucas, because the collapse is coming. All right, Justice Punch lands on Betsy's face. Sanguine Pool and Tides of Blight are comboed. Betsy's able to flash away to safety, but Shook plus Nagne making that work. We jump to the top lane and Prophet is overheating. Foxy's able to zone him away. Remember Fiora in the EU LCS, six and zero undefeated. This Fiora side lane could be one of the ways, should be one of the ways that Rocket looks to win this game. And just to backtrack to that uh, bit of shenanigans that happened in the jungle. Notice how patient Shook was in the use of abilities from Pride Stalker. He's only level five right now. I believe he was level four when the play actually happened, which means that he had a very high cooldown on both his Q and his W. So once those were down, Shook guaranteed that he was going to win that 1v1 trade. Then he just knew that with Nagme pushing in mid, he'd have the support of his mid laner too. And he wanted to try and get a summoner spell out. The intention was not to kill. It was to deny experience while also getting an experience lead by stealing away the camps. The difference was they did not respect that Betsy was going to come around and interfere. So Price Walker still got the experience that he should have lost, but Betsy ends up losing a flash as a result. So now what you'd want to see from NIP is to gank this middle lane, start attacking one of these solo laners that Rockout wants to get ahead. It's so difficult into a Vladimir. That Sanguine Pool is going to buy so much time if Betsy can use it appropriately. But Nagane, Shook, they can combo up very well. Let's see if they can punish his uh, flashless state. Um, Every time we look at the jungle, Pride Stalker or Shook are currently being spotted out. Um, Pride Stalker moved into NIP's jungle. He uh, poppity pinged the Scryer's Bloom. He did not just say it that. It revealed Shook, who pinged it out. Then, while Shook was on the Raptors, the ward that Pride Stalker placed allowed him to poppity ping Shook I'm and so reveal him on the Raptor camp. I'm very disappointed. Why, why is that, video? For those that don't know, the word poppity ping, some believe, means microwave in Welsh. That is, in fact, incorrect. That is not... Poppity ping is not a word, but the English love to use it to mock my pride nation. Proud of course, nation. Your pride nation. You see, this is why we make fun of you, okay? Once, once the Welsh learn to speak English correctly, then we shall continue we don't need to, to communicate. We have Welsh. Listen, love, you need to calm down, all right? <laughs> We're off to a good start as both teams are even going into the first seven and a half minutes. For anyone that would uh, heard my little 75% rant earlier, I have got disappointed uh, updates from our stats team. Oh no. Saying that I have offended their profession. <laughs> uh, we do get live updates from our production team and our stats team frequently, and they did not appreciate our little banter. <laughs> and Hyanin is not appreciating the damage from HeQ. 90 caliber net is sidestepped as Hyanin continues to dodge skill shots. Hyanin, by the way, had such a great performance against Fnatic. Um, his uh, <laughs> 1v1, shall I say, on Soaz's Kled, where they ran, ran around yep. the tower, was fantastic. But then more importantly, Hyanin continued to play that game exceptionally well. Highest damage source on his team, consistently a threat, despite the state. No matter how much gold ahead or behind he was, Hyanin was always somebody you had to keep your eyes on. And I just, I feel like as a broadcast, I love how much we've highlighted how strong Yanan has been in terms of the team. Because Rocket, like, sure, during the early weeks, they did not have the best of splits, but it was always this bottom lane of Rocket who we were always looking at being like, these are the shining stars. These could be the duo that turn things in favor of Rocket and, and can help them make their way up into the standings. And uh, especially, like, in their final games, like, Yanan was playing out of his mind, keeping his team alive. Yeah, and you look at the, the bans from this game already. Four out of five are targeted towards the bottom lane. Three support bans on what's hit. No Rakan, no Thresh, no Blitzcrank. What did is a playmaker, so it's actually interesting seeing him on the Zyra, a little bit more of a reactive, responsive champ in many ways. Well, either way, we're getting to 10 minutes. Infernal Drake is being soloed here by Pride Stalker. Good read of the map. A uh, couple of pings there from NIP as they realize the Infernal's being popped. They simply can't do anything to stop it or interrupt it. So early advantage here to Rocket. Got a little bit of scaling on their side, and 
Obviously, some damage to benefit every single member of the Rocket Squad. Yep. Uh, the Infernal Trait doesn't have a huge amount of value early on because yep. it gives you the additional 8% AP or a, uh, AP AD, and, but it's bonus, right? So if you don't have many items, you don't get a huge amount of value out of it. So in the early game, Rocket aren't going to be feeling too confident, but as the game progresses, again, thinking back to the skirmish style, it's going to be very important. Now, what we're noticing from NIP is a map movement up to the top half. Uh, Rockat, ooh, they're just going to use the ultimate. They are indeed. Shook needs to get in uh, closer if he wants to get this first blood assist. The Tongue Lash comes down from Sparkle. That's a fantastic trap from HQ. Ace in Foxy's hole for first blood. And time and time again, Shook is involved in these first bloods. He does it once more. Six out of his seven games. He has been the reason as to why NFP have made this play, but it isn't just him. We have to emphasize Profit with the push. This has been coming for a while now. The movement from Hiku and Sprottle to the top side of the map, using the Tom Kent ultimate to make that quick rotation. Everything came together for NIP, and they're doing exactly what they needed to, shutting down, getting ahead over these split pushes, these solo laners that want to rely on an early lead, or at the very least going even until the 20-minute mark. All right, first blood, first tower blood, and the Rift Herald secured by NAP momentarily. Rocket, they're not done yet. They're at least chunking down this inner turret in the bottom lane. And Hiku and Prophet are able to respond. So there's the Herald dying. Take stock of the situation, it's NIP with the first macro play uh, in terms of that lane swap, tower dive and tower. So it nets them a gold lead, it nets them a little bit of an advantage on the map, Betius. And bear in mind, I didn't exactly see what happened in the middle lane, but what I did see was Betsy teleport got cancelled. Now, I'm not entirely sure if it was Nagne interrupting it or whether or not it was just Betsy cancelling his TP to the top yeah. side. But the reality was Betsy did not go top. And if he had, that could have dissuaded the dive from NIP, but he doesn't join the fray. He doesn't provide support for Faxi. Faxi ends up dropping, and that enables NIP to get first blood, first tower blood, and the Rift Herald. And you have to realize that the reason why that's extremely important is even though NIP lost this tier one in the bottom lane, they can, should they use it correctly, guarantee a return tower thanks to the objective that they picked up. You mentioned losing that tower in the bottom lane. Rocket used that tower going down to set up Vision, which is now spotted in IP. So there's information for Rocket to work with. More importantly, information for Pride Stalker to work with. Again, an early game where Pride Stalker doesn't necessarily have a large impact. Shook another early game where he does. If we look at the two of them side by side, um, you know, kill participation at, at 15 minutes. Early game, it is literally night and day. Shook is more than two times more effective Working with his team and getting those those kills, of course, it helps when you get first blood in was yep. it six out of seven games. It's just early game is price over weakness. Exactly that. Like we've criticized him a lot for it. While sure he's earned the name Smite Stalker after his fantastic steals in the series versus Fnatic. Did he just win that Smite as well? He did. There yep. you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He, uh, consistently, his impact outside of that has been minimal. And, while there has been elements of growth compared to Shook, who is arguably a veteran at this point. Um, as we do see a bit of a trade at the top side. Sprattle with the response. Yeah, PQ jumps inside Sprattle's belly. Abyssal Voyage will send Foxy running. And that means, uh, for now at least, that pressure in the top lane is stopped. What was actually very important about that trade, the potential channel on the Rift Herald may have been interrupted. It looked like NIP were grouping around middle. And as we talk about grouping, Rocket going for a red Brambleback Steel. It stood right on top of a ward, though. So NIP are aware of this. Yeah, but NIP will just sacrifice their red buff in order to take down the mid-tier one. They have the Rift Herald. They have the priority on mid. You can see that both Yarnan and Wadid are going to be zoned away from this. Betsy's down in the bottom lane. Pride Stalker doesn't have the wave clear. Guaranteed objective for NIP. Yeah, very good play by NIP. Punishing Rocket for going for the red buff. The charge on the Herald will at least get a little bonk onto the inner turret. A touch of damage, but not much more. And that allows NIP to take the tower advantage. So we're getting closer to 15 minutes, Vedius. I'm looking at CS. Uh, Betsy, for the time being, plus 24, 23. Very close. Around plus 20 for Hyanin. So the bottom half of the map is farming, which is keeping this gold value closer after Rocket gave up the kill and that tower first blood bonus. Yes, and thinking in terms of the state of the game, Rocket is still fine, right? Their solar laners aren't so far behind that 
they're a real risk of being able to lose skirmishes. Betsy, he has picked up the Proto Belt, likely working towards, I believe, a Banshee's Veil next. And while typically Betsy is not ahead in terms of his individual lane, when you're going up against the Galio, it becomes a little bit easier. And uh, the thing about Betsy is while he hasn't been lane dominant, his impact becomes later on into the team fights when he has that opportunity to scale. Traditional Betsy was the same in spring. It was similar last year. Also, that stat includes this game. It was two and nine, now ah. three and ten, thanks to that Vladimir. Stats team whispering sweet nothings in my ear, Vedius. I notice they speak to you a lot. I know. Yet not me very I know. Often. It is a respect thing. They hear that. Uh, is it respect they do. or is it. Trevor, stop lying about our stats? No, they hear one in two shoutcasters make up stats on the spot. <laughs> I see. And they try to get away from that, you know? They can't trust these youngins, <laughs> Radius. Oh, I, think, I think we're chasing this story <laughs> a little too much, actually. Youngins. I do apologize to all the viewers out there. It's Vedius and I are having a little bit of fun with stats. Today. Bear in mind, like, this game, pretty slow to start off. So you yeah. have to liven it up a little bit. Adding a bit of personality, add some pizzazz, as you Ooh, would say. Talking about that, um, we actually had a bit of a chat to what did before the show started today. And of course, we did playmaker one of the more exciting supports to watch in game. Yep. Um, he was so happy about the win against Fnatic. And we said, so what can you tell us that you'd like to quote on air for today? And he said, well, Trevor, well, quick shot. He says, just like water flows and like the sky is blue, today Rocket wins. It was very, very wow. Bruce Lee inspired. And we're going to the mid game already, the scaling comp, the split push comp that can be set up by Rocket. What did may be the man that enables it. Could be. He is on the Zyra. Not the biggest of playmakers, but going back to MSI, it was that Zyra play that really won that big fight for SKT against G2. So, eyes a little bit on what did, seeing what he can do is, as NIP and Rocket continue to trade towers. Question is, will they go on to Faxi? No, well, doesn't seem to be a case just yet. Shook and Profit. Trading some tower damage, trading a tower kill. And the tower defense game continues. Three killed for an up heat. Two killed for Rocket. Piercing arrow. Straight between the uprights. Heq and Sprattle, not tag. I'm not seeing any huge surprises in the itemization at this stage. Close to 20 minutes, Heq. The option to finish off that static shiv or elsewhere. Uh, looking at Fox, the rapid fire cannon, sorry, his name just escaped me. Right, Smite Stalker, where is he? Gonna make his way in, not early enough. Grand challenge issued. <laughs> and just one little auto so, into the blast cone. What Faxi was trying to do there was he was expecting Shook to hit the blast cone to knock him over. The repost would have acted as a as a form of CC, <laughs> and therefore Faxi would have been able to stun Shook and perhaps get the kill. Uh, he realized Shook wasn't taking the bait, so he said, you know what, I'm out. I'm overextended here. I'm dead. Anyway, was that Sprattle being tagged while his gray health was popped and it didn't interrupt the recall? Oh. That's, what it, that's what it looks like to me. Either oh, way. that's his, um, the passive there from his go. targons. There we go. That thing. Sorted him out. Didn't really matter a huge amount. The tower wasn't under pressure. And Vedius, this has to be good for Rocket. They've got scaling champions. They've got a Fiora that just, at like 35 minutes, can just win. That's just kind of like a Fiora thing. Yes. Um, the thing about split pushing champions is you kind of want them to be ahead, but in this particular setup, you're fine if they're not ahead because you're against a tank in mid lane and a Rumble who's going to be building full damage. You will just naturally get outscaled against the Fiora. If you're an IP, you have to try and make stuff happen, which is why this is a great one for Spell if they get this kill. It is indeed four members chasing Foxy. It is just a matter of time and he gets burned alive. Hashtag profit. Kill number two for NIP. And this is exactly what you need to be doing because Rocket are still trying to buy time. They're still trying to turn into this 1-3-1 comp that NIP have no answers to. And so the responsibilities on NIP once they hit these spikes to try and make stuff happen around the map. Their first goal was, let's not give an early snowball lead to Faxi or Betsy, and let's try and make more fights happen around the map. All right, Rockat's uh, trying to start a fight. Chain of Corruption slowly spreading. Magne gets caught up in front. That's a good flash towards, and all of a sudden, NIP, they're looking for what did. He's able to walk away. Summoner spells blown left and right. Betsy takes down Magne, the first kill for Rocket. Sprattle's gray health is keeping him alive as the teleport from Prophet allows him to roast Pride. Stalker. Look at the lunges coming out from Foxy. Grand challenge is completed and he gets a kill. Rocket with the second. Shook way 
waiting to leap over the wall, but it's a flash from Betsy onto Shook. Sangunpool goes down, he's not able to pick up the kill, and Betsy escapes with his life. So NIP get baited into the fight by Rocket, and because they have the numbers advantage faster, it is them that end up coming out ahead in the fray. They should be able to take up this tower as well. Profit is too low to defend. So overall map advantage going in the favor of Rockat. And NIP, they have to be careful. The setup for that engagement is not as ideal as they would typically like. Oh, they oh Profit just gets dunked because what did the playmaker landed the roots? It was also a big mistake from Profit. He should have just conceded the tower. I know you wanted to try and force the AD carry away, but regardless, let's backtrack. Keep your eyes on where the rumble comes from. He still has his teleport up. Still no teleport, still no teleport, still no teleport. And Rocket at this point, they're in a 5v4, but they can just focus down this mid laner because he's only built magic resistance against the Lee Sin and a virus. That's not going to be enough to stop him. You then have Faxi coming in from the flank and Profit. He doesn't have the tools to stick to the back line. So Rocket can just split the members of NIP up, and that's where they excel. These small skirmishes, the 2v2s, the 3v3s, where they don't actually have to fight the full-blown 5v5. And it really helps when you interrupt the Galio ultimate to mitigate that damage reduction that he provides. Yeah, take him down. Prophet did not even use his teleport. He walked all the way from the bottom lane. It means it is available if the future fight breaks out. Hyanin with his Blade of the Rune King Hurricane doesn't even care. Good damage down onto EQ. Pride Stalkers looking for a target. Actually gets the heroic entrance, so that's a cooldown. Blown. Nagne, by the way, he cancelled his teleport a few minutes ago uh, to the mid lane tower. It has been long enough for that to become available very shortly. And NIP, this is a little bit worrying. If in the mid game they're already losing a team fight, They've got to be very, very careful, because this is where, theoretically, their uh, team should do well. Stranglethorns comes down, and Wadid saves his own life, in fact. And that was at cost of the equalizer from Dropbox. The thing is, NIP arguably shouldn't have lost that fight. It was simply the way in which they played it. Profit not using his TP soon enough. The fact that Nagne didn't ulti until very late into the fight, which made it extremely easy for Rockat to interrupt. There were just so many little things that could have made that fight better for NIP, yeah. and instead they just handed it to a silver platter for Rockat, where at that point in the game, sure, they hadn't hit a lot of their item spikes, but now they're going to be reaching them. Vladimir with both the Banshees and the Proto Belt finished up. Uh, Fiora working towards what will likely be the Ravenous Hydra, based on the Vampire Acceptor that she picked up. This is risky, very risky. No vision from the side of NIP, but I feel like your intuition would suggest something's happening, especially with this ward just outside the pit. Baron is going down fairly slowly. Foxy is not with the team yet. There we go, five members inside the pit. Teleport's being channeled by NIP. Yeah, comes the heroic entrance as a root down. Ooh. Massive knockout onto Rocket. The Baron is helping out with NIP. It's Pride Stalker, Smite Stalker that secures the buff as the fight ensues. Nagne's taken down. Rocket are wiping the ninjas. Sprattle is running for his life and Pride Stalker is just waiting for the autos. Hops across the wall. NIP are aced. Rocket keep all five members alive, get the Baron, and get an ace to shore up a fantastic early game. Beautiful play from Rockat, four and a half thousand gold in the lead. They are looking poised and ready to take the first game over NIP. And man, what a fight from Rockat. What was NIP thinking of it? I mean, you'd think that in a 5v5 scenario, this is the optimal setup for NIP to get the kill, but NIP, PQ, he hasn't hit the spikes really to enable him to do the damage. And keep your eyes on exactly what Betsy's doing. Zoning so many members. PQ, he's not really hitting anyone in the fray. This heal comes in the middle of the fight as well to just allow Rockat to feel even healthier in the entire exchange. And I feel like that with the amount of tools the Rockat had to keep NIP out of the pit, it was just too difficult for them to really win the fight. I was trying to count how many auto attacks HQ got off. It was about five before he was jumped on. Uh, the build-up, full channel on Ace on the hole, using the Q in and out. I mean, 500 damage in a Caitlyn. It's just not going to win you fights at this stage of the game. Right, it, this this graph is just a is it explains perfectly, <laughs> right? Like I, I'm lost for words as to how how perfect that fight was for Rocket because NIP just don't do any damage. They need like the two, three items on the Caitlyn before they're really able to force a fight. 
and they wanted to be proactive in the sense of trying to punish these side lanes, trying to shut down Faxi and Betsy. They were doing a good job of it by utilizing Spruddle, roaming him around the map. But just look at the level difference between Hyanan and Hikyu. What that, is it, Betty? It's like 14 to 11. This early into the game is just insurmountable. Just the base stats alone are more than enough to be able to out-trade Hikyu. It's, yep. it's insane. And then you've got double Infernal Dragon and Baron at 25 minutes. Rocket definitely showing up here in week three of the European LCS. They picked up their first win against Fnatic and they're setting themselves up for a game victory today if they can close this one out. Tower in the bottom lane falls, pressure in the mid lane, pressure in the top. This is a split push team's dream to have Baron this early on and then Infernals if they need any more late game insurance. Yep. It's uh, certainly a tough one for NIP to really come back into this. We have seen them do it before. Bear in mind that now they will have farm constantly being pushed into them. So that at least they have some kind of an influx in gold wow. and the enemy team, perhaps they're in a position where you can try and force a fight, so. I love that. The, the mini waves being pushed into them. It's one of my favorite narratives. Normally I'm the guy to say it, because it's such an optimistic way of looking I mean, at it, right? That's how I like to look at it. Being <laughs> like, hey guys, we get free gold for the next like four minutes. Let's uh, let's farm up. Let's, maybe. let's farm up. Uh, down six thousand. But 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 every little step counts, right? Yep. Foxy, where is the support here from NIP? As Prophet has jumped on. Grand challenge, not going to be completed. But look, 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 three members get sent top. Rocket just pushed mid, right? Like this is the obnoxious thing about the one through one comp. Everyone's Pets. talking about how OP Zack is. Everyone talking about how OP Galio is. The true OP Fiora. I, Six and O Venius. I mean, I've I, I've thought for a... Uh, of course you have. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, along with the other analysts on our team, have uh, thought that Fiora was a fairly strong pick. And she has been fairly consistently banned by a lot of teams fairly often throughout the regular season. Um, and it's just because of how well she does into a lot of tanks and how well she scales, right? Her laning phase isn't even that bad either. Uh, I wouldn't say that she's blind pickable um, because it's super easy to camper, like Renekton uh, and Lee Sin could do a really good job of shutting it down. So I think that there are risks associated with her and I thought that it was risky for Faxi to blind pick her, um, but they made it work. Yeah, and of course you can see on your screen right now, Grabs and Freddy, former top laner, former Worlds contestant at one stage, one of Europe's best top laners. We're talking about the Fiora, uh, banned 19 games. 19. The split. So they are. Uh, pros agree with the analyst team here in Europe. Nicely done, nicely done. Results-based analysis is always fantastic. <laughs> the threat alone. Rocket just have to close this one out. Um, at this stage with another Infernal coming up in two minutes, with Baron coming up in about three minutes. You just have to feel that one or two of those objectives and then Rockout will look to close the game out. Um, and NIP, they're now hoping for a misposition or a, a way of punishing Rockout. Because Rockout just have to play the map. They're hoping that a keyboard explodes. I mean, what? Well, Shook, Shook has done that to people in the past because he <laughs> stole multiple barons, right? That's true, that's true. But so is Pride Stalker. So what happens when you have two smite stealing legends who always steal barons? That is the question. When an immovable object is hit by an unstoppable exactly. force, what happens? Let's see Banshee's Veil is pop. Shook. Gonna get the support of Nagne as the heroic entrance comes down. Stranglethorns knocks up NIP. What did is on a killing spree because of course he is. Just like water flows and the sky is blue. What did called it that rock out will win. Pride Stalker runs down Prophet. The challenge is completed and Nagne's drop. NIP's duo running for the hills. Rockat are just too strong at this point for NIP to answer. They tried to go for the fight, but the difference in power is just too much as Rockat take their first inhibitor of the game. Oh, not even a worry. 11 kills to three. Even Steven's early game and just a few team fights, a few decisions started the snowball. Rocket have taken their second inhibitor, and because the waves were set up earlier, this is just beautiful. Every single objective, without a Baron, without an Elder, it's not even 30 minutes yet. Very clean play overall from Rocket. 
just highlighting back to how that the whole composition, the whole goals were given the composition that NIP had, you wanted to go even during the laning phase. And then NIP, they did a good job at the very least of shutting down Faxi. NIP were trading towers, NIP were getting good control, but Rockat, they found this one pivotal fight in the mid lane, which snowballed the entire map in their favor. And you can see in this fight, again, like it's so difficult for NIP without that hard engage to properly get onto the back line of Rockat and pose a real threat. You have Prophet by himself coming into the fray, doing what he can, but that NIP, they're going for a last ditch Baron attempt. Oh, but Betsy's already caught everyone, jumps in at the Hemo plate. Him and Yarnin get the first kill. Sparkles down, Magne falls thereafter, and Rockat are just plucking NIP apart. Foxy's gonna look to run down HeQ, or actually just say, screw that, the Nexus is the target. They've taken all three inhibitors down. Rockat looking poised to continue NIP's lose streak. That was a great sentence, Vedius. HeQ's taken down, and as Rockat looked to continue NIP's lose streak, <laughs> they need to do it by knocking over the Nexus turrets. The first one falls. There is no resistance. There is no stopping Rockat. And this is just such a great game. Rockat, pull apart ninjas in pajamas. It's the sound of golf claps. <laughs> oh, come on, guys. They very are. Oh, they're not done yet. Gonna go for a dive underneath the tower. The Nexus pops and Rockat take game number one. I mean, look, that was just, that was clean. Yep, very, very clean. I was optimistic for NIP early on. I thought that there was some good stuff coming out from them. The fact that they made that map move into the top tower, took it early. Um, they wanted to try and open up the map a little bit more so they could utilize this Tom Kench. Just keep shutting down these side laners. We saw <laughs> Faxi, he ended up dying twice that game because of proactive plays coming out from NIP. But then when it came to this mid-game fight, they were just kind of hamstrung. Like, Caitlyn wasn't strong enough. She is a little bit more reliant on having more items underneath her belt. Nagne just couldn't really utilize the ultimate. There were a lot of things that went wrong for NIP. They couldn't yeah. quite get the 5v5 that they wanted. And, it just uh, felt like some, some miscommunication uh, in the team at times. Some of those calls to go in, um, which maybe is not, odd, right? Maybe not how... reading the map properly, maybe not reading their uh, teammates properly. Yeah, like, uh, and that's a little odd considering how good they were as a team when it came to setting a vision and making a lot of those early proactive plays. Yeah, I quite like the vision this game. We will talk about that more in game number two. Rocket kept the pressure on their opponents and IP. They pulled out the win. That's Rocket, of course, for more. Let's see what the analysts have to say. Thank you very much, Quick Shot. Of course, Interesting game one coming out in the end. Rockat dominating from that mid game point on. I want to take a chance now to look at the pick ban phase to see exactly how this one unfolded. Because to me, when I look at these two compositions, mm -hmm. I see a Vladimir, I see a Fiora, and that tells me if you want to win, you're going to need to do it early because you are going to get outscaled. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to rant here. I'm sorry I didn't set this up with you. NIP's composition screams of people or somebody that has watched LCK and they go, okay, Gadio, great pick. Kaylin, great pick. Tom Kench, great pick. Kha'Zix, great pick. Rumble, amazing pick. You don't think about it when you're putting it together. You've got a, got a Caitlyn in a lane that's going to get pushed in, that won't have damage early, with a Galio mid who won't have damage early, and a Rumble who you need to then visit and camp and get ahead and make sure that you have damage throughout the beginning of the game, and then you don't go and do it early enough in the game. And we were talking about this Shook, they set up Vision topside and just couldn't really push it too early on. So it, it just screams of the same thing NIP have had the last couple of weeks, which is like great champion picks, but ultimately a draft that just fails in a lot of areas. Well, and it's interesting to me because I feel like a lot of that damage can come from the Kha'Zix and the Rumble in the early game. Max, sort of what was your impression if we're talking specifically about NIP? How did you feel about this composition overall? Do you kind of share Stress's feelings here that it's uh, low damage or potentially like a flawed draft? What is your thoughts on it? Well, I for sure agree that they should have done something early game if they wanted to win against Vladimir and Fiora. But as you saw in this game, this Vladimir was same CS, the Fiora was same CS. And they ha even though that NIP had winning top, winning mid and winning jungle, they didn't abuse it as much. They should have probably gone in and contested, contested the second red buff of Lee Sin mm -hmm. and contested more wraiths and everything and just deny Lee Sin as much as possible, force him to the other side of the map, which was kind of already happening since the map was split, which I think is more favorable to Rockat since, you know, NIP needs to snowball. And they didn't do this. Uh, Shook just one time went invaded and warded the topside jungle after Lee Sin had already taken it. So it was just a complete waste of time and the laners were not getting, doing anything with their lead and then it just got to mid game and 
Yeah, it was pretty over. It did feel like one of the picks that stood out to me was the, was the priority on Tom Kent. We've mm -hmm. seen NIP go for the support uh, pretty repeatedly. Uh, I feel like it had some strength in this game, but maybe not as much as was expected. What do we expect this pick to do normally, and kind of how did it play out for NIP here? I think one of the things, that, and Max Lowe, you were talking about this a lot during the game, the strength comes from the ultimate. And there was the one play that, that they actually did utilize on the top side that, that did put this team comp together to start, at least, was this move towards the top side. This is what we were wanting NIP to do more, maybe even a little earlier, right? Yeah, well, because they have Tom Kench and he hit six and they somehow got a reset, he just goes top lane ulties and they suddenly have tempo. They're there faster than Rocket can do anything, so they're able to get a free Rift Tower from that. Um, it was pretty good use of Tom ulti, but as I said before, they just didn't use the lead from their mid and top early enough. The Fura was still fine against Rumble, she was still even in CS, and then they kept trading, NIP just kept trading, and that's completely fine for Rocket. They're just chilling and waiting for the yeah, late game. And we saw, once it got to that mid-game, yeah. pull up our second replay, how, how bad things start to get yeah. when you let a Vladimir and a Fiora go into a mid-game uncontested, and you can just see, starts off with a very good ultimate from Karen, but as more members of the team join, how quickly things go south for and NIP. The fact that Wadid doesn't die here is kind of key, because he comes up and turns the fight around later on, and you can see Hyanan untouched at this point is in a safe point in the game. He's got a fair amount of damage himself, and it means the Rockad can kind of just move through this fight, and the only real danger is Prophet, and then suddenly he's not surrounded by anybody. Rumble can't do anything here when he's trying to chase down targets that'll be able to turn around and kill him, and for that, Rockad gets so much benefit on the fact NIP couldn't team fight with this composition that they get the lead onto both the Fiora and onto this Vladimir, and from there, they basically have full control of the game. And they definitely do, and we look at our third replay now as we look at the Baron that essentially decided the game. If it wasn't already going in Rockat's favor enough, this definitely was the final nail in the <laughs> coffin for the team. And this is the worst feeling. When you go to contest the Baron and your entire team dies and the enemy team still gets Baron. And Shook's there. Max, though, you were having flashbacks at this point. Yeah, but it, was, it, it wasn't a 50-50 since Shook was just uh, dead here. And he was owned. But yeah, I mean, by this point, it was kind of already over. Rocket just made a really ballsy call. They knew about NIP's resets and they just went to the Baron. It was already pretty low. NIP didn't have enough members there at the start and they didn't have enough time to kind of plan what to do. And they just went in and died one by one. This Vladimir had, was unkillable under the Fiora ultimate. And yeah, it was just a lost cause at that point. All right, looking into next game, is this a situation where if you're NIP, are you saying, hey, we need to change our draft, we need to make something different happen? Or are you talking about execution? Hey, we need to be more aggressive in the early game. We can take the same draft and win. We just have to change the way we're playing. I think it was a winnable game with this draft. As much as I dislike the way they played around it, I think you can win with this draft. We've seen teams doing very similar things, but I think as we were talking about top side impact a little bit earlier, utilize the winning lanes that you actually pick for yourself and not just like let this Vladimir scale at the same time. I think. NIP could very well just go out with the same thing, but I think if we end up swapping teams, maybe a Blitzcrank or that Thresh comes through and we get a completely different draft. Definitely potential. Max Lohr, looking at this, 2-1 the initial prediction. Are you, are you <laughs> sticking with the 2-1 here? Do you think it might be a 2-0? Uh, how does that change after that first game? Honestly, just looking at how scared NIP played and the lack of macro game, I guess, in the mid late, like there was just really no comeback potential. It was really one-sided this game. I would want to change my prediction to 2-0, but... I'm not that kind of guy. I don't go back on my words, so 2-1. I, I, you know, I wouldn't let you anyway, and we'll find out why you may or may not be right soon. Of course, Rockhead are looking to close out this series, and we'll be back with Game 2 in just a minute. Don't go anywhere.